Ah, it's time to chill out and get ready for a mediocre Q&A live stream. If you're old enough, grab yourself your favorite adult beverage. And if you're not, stick with apple juice. Put your feet up and relax. If you have any questions, feel free to ask them in the chat. And now let's cue up the intro music. What is up, everybody? Hopefully you guys are doing well. I hope you guys are having a great new year. Hopefully your holidays were awesome. It's been a... I think I skipped the last stream. So yeah, it's been a while since we've done a stream. Uh, took a little much needed time. Well, I, I shouldn't say I took time off. The only thing I took time off from was from the live stream. <laughs> I still worked like crazy and did all that normal stuff. But life is good. I have a lot to be thankful for. Um, you know, I, I, as I reflect on the past year and all the things that frustrated me and made me angry, it's all really petty stuff in comparison to things going on around the world. So um, I'm very thankful for that. I've really been thinking about that stuff a lot lately and and how petty my problems are. Um, so I, I guess I'm very thankful for all that. But hopefully you guys are all doing well. As usual, I have a list of things that I want to talk about. And then we've got the live chat going on. We'll definitely pay attention to that too. So if you guys have questions or things you want me to cover in the stream, be sure to put it in the chat in caps lock. I'll try to get to it. Do me a favor too, um, in the chat, how are my audio levels? I, I made a little bit of an adjustment because it seemed like it was peaking to me. So is the audio coming across good inside the chat? I'll kind of wait for that to come through. Hello to everybody that's in here right now. Um, let's see, uh, looking through the chat, lots of cool conversations going on as usual. If you guys are watching this on a TV or something like that, and you can't see the live chat, there's a lot of stuff going on in the live chat. There's great conversations, a good community inside the live chat. Uh, John Hershey, thank you so very much for that super chat, man. That is amazing. Uh, thank you so much for your support. Okay. Um, let me see what we got going on in here. Uh, um, looks like I'm good. All right, cool. Right on. So we're going to go ahead and roll with this one. Thank you everybody for answering that question. Um, so had a couple videos since the last live stream, I think four to be exact. Um, but we're going to go ahead and cover the, the most recent two. So we had two of them where the one where the customer didn't show up for the beginning part of the video 
And then we also had the, I was told to work on the wrong unit. So, all right, glad. I'm good. I'm glad that the audio is coming in. And Chris Cooley says my audio is coming through mediocre. That's perfect. That is perfect. If I'm coming through mediocre, that that's, that's what I'm about. So <laughs> right on. Thank you very much for all the nice words. Uh, I can't pronounce the name. Uh, I, I don't even know. Corbag. Uh, SX. Uh, thank you so much for the nice words, man. Much appreciated. So, um, well, uh, here in Southern California, the last week we've had actually like the last two to three weeks, we've had rain like all the time. And this happens every couple years. We'll get like a crazy downpour. Um, and then usually it tapers off and we don't get rain for the rest of the year. You know, we can hope that we're going to get more rain, but as much as we got in the last three weeks, it was kind of starting to get annoying because it was just like every single day and you couldn't schedule anything. Uh, we don't really get rain that often here. So, you know, I mean, we, we enjoy it because we need it, but then it's like kind of a burden. Uh, everybody here in Southern California, uh, they do not know how to drive when they get on the roads. Um, you know, the first bit of rain that we have brings all the oils out of the roads that have been just sitting in the asphalt and stuff, and it creates accidents. It's just a nightmare. Um, we had some snow in our local mountains, uh, you know, more than we've had in a while. We had a, a major road washout in our local mountains, Highway 18. Um, so that's closed indefinitely. So it's, it's having to reroute people to their homes and stuff. It's kind of a bummer, but this is what happens when we don't have the infrastructure for this kind of stuff. It, you know, it kind of affects us pretty big when we get a good rain. So, um, with that being said, I'll go ahead and cover this question and I get this one a lot and I find myself having to cover it a lot. You know, the whole purpose of these live streams is to consolidate questions. So I don't have to repeat it, you know, uh, constantly answer the same question. So I, I address this one a little bit in the live stream, usually every couple months. But uh, one of the most common questions I get is why in the heck do I pipe my condensate number one in copper? And number two, when I'm working on package units, why do I pipe it into the drains? Why don't we just let it drain onto the roof? Okay. And it's actually a pretty reasonable answer to that. Number one, we have code requirements that require us in most cities to pipe condensate runoff from the air conditioning units into the sewer, okay, or into the plumbing system. And the reason why is most of our storm drains, right, if we pipe the condensate onto the roof, it'll go down in the gutter and then end up in a storm drain. And most of our storm drains go directly to the ocean. So they want as much water as we can that, you know, is not naturally falling from the sky to be piped into the sewer. That way it can go through water treatment plants. So that way it's cleaned before it gets dumped into the ocean. But there's always some carryover. So that's why they have us pipe our stuff. Uh, I really appreciate you being a supporter for so long. It's amazing. And uh, uh, yeah, definitely. You guys, I don't have the links or anything like that, but we do have a Discord server. Uh, it's the HVACR Videos Discord server. If any of you are interested in joining the HVACR Videos Discord server, feel free to send me an email to HVACRvideos at gmail.com. I know I always go through this, but I don't have it readily available and I'm kind of a dumb dumb when it comes to finding them and stuff. So uh, but feel free to send me an email and I can give you a join link. So uh, to be fair, though, I'm not in the Discord server as much as I used to be, uh, really not in it very much at all. I go in there occasionally and say hi to everybody, but there's a whole community going on in the Discord server. So it's kind of cool. Um, let me see. Oh, no, I can't deal with that. Some, my dad's texting me right now asking me questions. He must not know that I'm live. Um, all right. Let's see what we go in here. Um, uh, you know what? Hey got to help out my dad when my dad has a question. So you guys are just going to have to bear with this while I text my dad back real quick. So, um, let's see my dad. Uh, he quickly asked me a question. He said, what is it that I order when I go to in and out in and out is a local hamburger chain in Southern California. So if I do go to in and out, what he's asking me is a, uh, cheeseburger with fried mustard. Um, and what that is, is, uh, they take the cheeseburger, the burger patty when it's raw and they actually fry it in mustard. They cook it in mustard and it just gives it a cool little twist to it. So anyways, uh, in and outs kind of an acquired taste. Uh, it's hit and miss. Some people don't like in and out in and out is a West coast thing. It's, it's slowly branching out. So I believe they're in California, Arizona, Nevada, Texas. Um, and I'm sure they're in a few other places too, but, um, pretty cool little burger place. I'm kind of burned out on it because I've grown up on it, eaten my entire life. But, um, okay. So 
Uh, next thing, uh, answering that same question that I was just talking about, why do I pipe my condensate into the drains? Uh, why do I use copper? Uh, I don't like using PVC. The sun just deteriorates everything on the roofs out here. So copper lasts forever. The downside to using copper is tweakers get on the roof and steal the copper. So you paint the copper. Most of the tweakers are pretty dumb. So if you paint it, they just leave it alone. But, um, so I wanted to kind of talk about something. I know we have a lot of viewers and people, uh, constantly coming into the channel that don't understand exactly who I am and what I do. So I'm going to do a little introduction about myself. My name is Chris. Um, I am an HVACR service technician first. Uh, I am a business owner. Um, and uh, I grew up in the trade, right? I grew up working for my father. My father um, started in the trade in 1987, I think. And uh, I worked with him all my life as a little kid. I can remember sitting on his bucket getting yelled at because his four cell or three cell D mag light, right? If you guys are in the trade for a long enough time, you know what I'm talking about. But the mag lights had four D batteries or three D batteries, depending on which one he had. Usually he had the three cell. And uh, I can remember getting in trouble because, you know, I was a little six, seven year old sitting on a bucket while he was in a restaurant fixing something, holding this big flashlight and I couldn't hold it steady. Number one, because it was heavy. Number two, because I'm like, oh, look at that. And, you know, and I can hear, damn it, Christopher, put the light over here. You know, and it's like, oh, OK, you know, I just get distracted like a little puppy. But I grew up working for my father. Ironically, um, you know, I really started working with them come like junior high time. I would in the summer, I would go to work with them full time. Well, Southern California summers can be rather brutal, pretty darn hot out here. Uh, on average, we usually have one to two months above 100 degrees. Sometimes it peaks about 115. Um, you know, typically for at least three months of the summer season, it's above 90. So um, I remember telling him that I wanted absolutely nothing to do with this trade after working so many years with him. I was just like, I just don't want to do it, you know? So then I went into high school, uh, started uh, working at a body shop, working on cars. Um, you know, I just basically took cars apart and put them back together so they could be painted and all that fancy stuff. And uh, did that for about two years and then came to work for my dad full time, just decided I wanted to get into it. That was the uh, beginning of the part of the year of 2000 and, uh, 2002, actually. Yeah. So April of 2002, I think is when I officially started working full time in the trade and, uh, been going strong ever since I'm now a owner in the company. My dad and I own it together. Um, my dad has three feet out the door. He's, if I let him, he'd retire yesterday. So, uh, he doesn't work in the field or anything like that anymore. He just, uh, does administrative work working in the office, but I learned everything from my dad, good and bad. Okay. The bad things that I learned from him, I learned how to grow from those things. So I don't fault him for anything. Um, but I am who I am because of him. Right. So, uh, I started making these videos for my service technicians as a training aid. Uh, because of some mistakes that we made, we lost several employees at one time and I found myself hiring several technicians all at once that were all experienced, but they weren't experienced in the way that I do things. So started using these YouTube videos as like a training aid, like, Hey, this is how I approach this call. So if you go look at the very first video on my channel, it was a beer walk in that had a blown fuse. That was a video that I made for my, my service technicians. And then the second video was also for my service technicians. And then after that, I made them public. And then here we are now. Okay. So I do not know everything, nor will I ever. Um, but this is a great way. This has afforded me the ability to contact very smart people, much smarter than I in the industry and get in touch with them and collaborate with them. Uh, there's a great community in uh, the, the, the social media area side of the trade, right? Um, you have a lot of other content creators and it is a small little world. So we kind of mostly do know each other between all the little content creators and we usually help each other out. Um, I was just calling my buddy Brett Wetzel from the advanced refrigeration podcast over the weekend. We just had a conversation about an expansion valve issue I was running into. So I called him and picked his brain about it, you know? So it's really cool, but I am constantly learning. I will never know everything. Okay. Um, so that's who I am. Uh, you know, I just, I make these videos and, and I just have fun doing it. So, uh, let's see. Um, uh, yeah, I've had that question a bunch, uh, asking if I would have my father on the show. Um, you know, I don't think he really has any interest in being on this. Um, I've kind of mentioned it a few times to him, but I'll bring it up to him again, but I don't know if it's really something that he's very interested in doing is coming into the public thing. You know, for some people you have to understand, you know, making a video, um, you know, even, even live right now, there's only 150 people in here. Uh, do me a favor. There is 150 people in here. There's only 65 likes on the video. Smash the thumbs up button. Okay, please. 
Um, but you know, these videos get a lot of views and some people just, you know, have a hard time uh, doing that kind of stuff in public. It's not, it's interesting because here I come on here and I have, you know, I'm just like, whatever, I have no shame. I talk about almost anything. Uh, if you guys don't already know, I also do another show, another live show with my friends on the HVAC Overtime YouTube channel. And what I mean when I talk about anything is I, I really do just about talk about anything. Okay, so go check out the HVAC Overtime channel um, and you'll see lots of live shows on there with my friends and it's a total different dynamic. A um, little less education, a little more BS, okay? Um, but it's a great fun show with my friends. So uh, let's see what else we got going on in here. How many Tecumseh AH compressors have I replaced? Um, I, I don't know. I mean, quite a few, you know, um, over my career. Uh, you know, it's interesting, though, because the beginning part of my career, I changed a lot of compressors, you know, but it was more towards the middle and the latter part of my career that I like. I, I really have reduced the amount of compressors that I change because I really attack the problems before they present themselves and make the compressor fail. Because compressors typically don't go bad by themselves, guys. It's very rare that a compressor fails on its own. You know, they're usually the, the I know it's a corny phrase, but compressors are murdered usually, okay? Um, they should last you know, 20 something, 30 something years if taken care of properly, you know, I mean, you should get a lot of life out of them, especially the older compressors, because they were made so much more, um, or had so much more uh, quality in the older compressors for sure. So, uh, let's see what else. Um, it, it, Jason Johnson says, if we didn't continue learning, it would get boring. And that is the truth. Uh, I definitely hit a phase in my career where I was really starting to get burnt out. Uh, and these videos actually challenged me and pushed me to the edge because you guys would be so surprised to find out that when I turn on a camera, um, I listen to myself talk when I'm talking. So I'm working through a problem. I'm troubleshooting something. I'm talking to the camera. And then I realize, wait, that didn't make sense. You know, and then I think about it like, wait, that didn't, you know, and then I, I kind of rationalize with myself and, and having the camera there actually helps me to be a better technician because I'm constantly thinking, okay, wait, oh, you know, cause I, I'm, by heart, I'm lazy, right? By nature. I, I just want to get, don't get home as fast as possible, but sometimes I'll be filming a video and then it's like, you know what? I'm not going to finish filming this. I'm just going to do this and get out of here. But then I'm like, no, you know what? I'm going to finish this. I'm going to go through with this. So just because I talk about the big picture approach and the big picture diagnosis thing doesn't mean that I always do that. Like I'm constantly trying to take shortcuts to make my job easier. And sometimes I have to remind myself, no, step back, slow down and do it right. Okay. So just like everybody else, I try to take my time, but you know, there's sometimes that I'm not the best technician out there. Um, I definitely want to, uh, let me, I have a list of things in front of me that I'd want to talk about and I usually like to cross them off. So I'm crossing that one off real quick. And then uh, I wanted to talk about something. Um, I was just talking about, oh, this is it right here. So I get this question and I get, you know, I, first off, I get a lot of comments after I, I address this, okay? Uh, we get a lot of trolls in the comments, okay? And let me let me put this out there. The trolls do not get to me, okay? But I do read as many comments as I can. So I do read their comments. Sometimes I just laugh. Sometimes I respond sarcastically. Uh, like there was one troll that uh, Samurai, thank you so very much for that super chat, man. I really, really appreciate you. Um, so you said that uh, your drive to an emergency service call, boys, nothing better. Oh, that's right on, bud. So I appreciate it. So um, anyways, yeah, there's trolls that come in the comments and stuff and, and they don't get to me, but I do read their comments and sometimes I laugh. Sometimes I, like I said, respond sarcastically. Um, but uh, this person was was bitching at me about venting my frustrations. They were saying that I complain too much. Stop complaining. Just get over it and get the call fixed and move on. But you know what? Um, I kind of want to say that's an ignorant statement. Okay. And what I mean by that is that, you know, we're, we're trained by a certain group of people, even growing up, you know, there's things that you don't talk about. That's, we don't talk about our feelings. We don't talk about taboo stuff. And I actually think it's important to an extent. I don't want to complain all the time, but I do like to vent every once in a while on my platform to let people know that I go through struggles too. I'm not some all knowing person that knows how to fix every single problem. I'm not so all perfect person that, you know, gets paid millions of dollars to fix everything. I run into problems and I try to show that to show that I'm human on the channel. Okay. So while that guy was a troll and he was just bitching about me complaining, uh, he, he did bring up a good point that gives me a conversation point. So thank you very much for being a troll, whoever you are. Um, but you know, I mean, it's important. I think that every once in a while now, 
you know, there's also a fine line between complaining too much, you know, um, constantly whining and crying about every single thing now. But I mean, you know, to an extent, I like people to know that I run into problems, right? And it happens. And that's life. Um, if you don't vent that stuff, if you don't have someone to talk to about your frustrations, if you bottle that stuff up, trust me from experience, it sends you to a dark place. For me, it sent me to a place of rage. Okay. I, I had some mental problems. I had to go see help. I saw a psychologist and a therapist for, I went through an 18 month program where I was dealing with anger issues. And, and a lot of that was like mommy issues and stuff because I had you know, just all kinds of family stuff. It's funny because I was talking to my buddy, Bill, Curious HVAC guy earlier today on the phone, and he was saying that I should do an episode on this. So maybe I will. I'll do a how I live the HVACR life episode and I'll talk about some of my issues. But, but you know, I found myself bottling all that stuff up and it's so easy to bottle things up and just suck it up and not talk about it, but it, it builds up and it, it, it gets you all wound up and then you explode. And at least in my case, um, you know, I punched a hole in the wall and it just scared me because I didn't hurt myself, but it was just like, what's this going to lead to if I don't take care of this problem, if I keep bottling this stuff up. So I sought help and, and I got the help that I needed. So I think it's important that we learn how to vent that stuff and talk about it. Right. Okay. So enough sappy stuff. Let's get on to the HVACR talk. Um, so, um, in the live chat earlier, so again, there's a whole live chat going on and it's a great chat. They were talking about, um, you know, places that we go to escape happy places. If you want to say that, okay. Uh, my happy place, I've, I've talked about it before. Uh, I have not been to my happy place in a long time. My place that I go to relax is the mountains. I like to get out and go hiking, uh, backpacking. That is a passion of mine. I have not been backpacking in many, many years now. The last time I went, was when I took my, my, my black Labrador retriever that I used to have, uh, but she passed away two years ago and it was probably two years prior to that. So it's probably been a good four or five years since I've actually gotten out and done what I love to do. But I am at peace when I am somewhere without a map, without lights, without anything, and just a backpack on my back and just getting lost somewhere. One of my favorite trips that I ever took with my lab, her name was Ava, um, was her and I, we were really late because I was busy working and I couldn't go hiking. I couldn't get off work in time and we didn't get to start at the trailhead until midnight. It was midnight and we started at this trailhead and we started hiking down a trail and we got lost. Um, and we ended up sleeping on the side of a mountain. We were, we were aiming to go to a certain location and I could not find it in the middle of the night. And we ended up hiking up and setting up a hammock and I slept in the hammock with my dog breathing in my face. It was very uncomfortable. My hammock slid down the tree when I was sleeping. I ended up on the ground. But guess what? When it was all said and done, it's one of the most memorable experiences I ever had. I was lost in the woods and it was just me and my dog and we had a blast. So um, that's my happy place is getting outside and going hiking. I'm hoping I, I'm, I'm Got a new puppy. His name is Luke. Um, he's another, he's a silver Labrador retriever. And uh, I'm hoping that him and I can enjoy some of those experiences soon in the future. But, you know, I find that I haven't gone and done those things that I need to do in a long time. And I need to get back to that because I need to go, you know, get some peace from, you know, from everything, craziness of life and all that stuff. So uh, let's see what else we got going on in here. Oh, wow. Let's see. Um, I'm looking through the chat right now. And uh, did I go to trade school for HVACR? Yes, I did go to trade school. So I got a education from my dad. My dad taught me the trade, but then I also enrolled in a local community college that had a trade program, Mount San Antonio Community College in Walnut, California, Mount Sac. Uh, I went to Mount Sac. I never finished the program. I'm two classes shy of finishing the program, uh, technical math for HVACR and, uh, welding. <laughs> uh, is it, maybe that's why my welding's so bad. Um, but yeah, no, I, I need to, uh, finish that program one of these days for sure. But yes, I did go to trade school. Um, and I am a formal believer in trade school. Uh, Let's see. Chris Cooley said, skip a live stream, live stream and get some time. Yeah, I definitely will. Work has been pretty chaotic right now. So work is actually the limiting factor in me, but I definitely, Hey man, uh, Jason Johnson said the gun range hundreds of rounds. That's his therapy. Whatever floats your boat, we need to do it more. And I do, as I say, not as I do, right? Because I'm not walking the walk here because I've just been so consumed with work. So, um, all right. Uh, let me go ahead and get through my next questions and things I want to talk about right now. So, um, 
Nathan asked about stat. Oh, this is a really good question. So Nathan emailed me asking me a question about using digital scales. Okay. And this is intriguing. I have some questions in Nathan's statement. I'm going to paraphrase it. So Nathan emailed me and was curious about my thoughts on this because he was always taught that when he's using a digital scale, what he's supposed to do is weigh the cylinder before he starts putting it in the system. Then he can weigh the weigh the refrigerant as he's putting it in the system and then weigh the cylinder after to compare if there's any discrepancies between what the scale said while he was adding it to the system and what it said before and after. Um, Tails303, thank you so very much for that super chat. That is amazing. I really, really appreciate you. Um, and let's see. He says uh, he wants me to say his Minecraft server, playersmp.net. Uh, playersmp.net. Okay, bud. Um, so um, I got distracted here with this real quick. And where was I going? I already lost. Oh, uh, the refrigerant. So um, weighing the cylinder before. So his question was, he was always taught that when he's weighing the refrigerant in the system, that static discharge can mess with what the scale says. And so that's why you want to weigh it before and confirm as you're putting it in. Now, I don't know if I quite believe in that. Let me step back if I didn't explain that right. He's thinking that sometimes there can be static discharge, which is true when you're adding refrigerant into the system. And he's saying that can mess with the reading that you get as you're weighing it into the system. Now, I personally have never seen that before, but I do find truth in your statement and what you were describing because my normal process is to take a cylinder, weigh it before I use it, then add it to the system, right? And I'm, I have it on the scale. And the reason why I weigh it before from experience with the older scales, they were very susceptible to static discharge. So this is a little different than what you were thinking. And I could be incorrect. I've never seen it mess with the numbers as it's going. But what I have seen it do is as you're adding the refrigerant to the system, it will short out. There'll be a static electricity shock going to the scale and it'll actually short the scale out and make it not work anymore. I have had that happen on older scales. Like as I was adding refrigerant, I saw a little spark go from the refrigerant cylinder to the scale and then boom, the scale went blank and stopped working. Okay. So because of that, the first time that happened, it screwed up because I was working on a critically charged system. And from that point, I always learned to weigh my cylinder before, write it on the tank, then use the scale as I'm adding it to the thing. And then that way, if I ever ran into a problem, I can always look at what it weighs after. So yeah, I do agree that it's good to weigh the cylinder before and after. Um, but I, I don't know. I've never heard of there being a discrepancy due to static as you're adding those, the, the stuff. So he's basically saying that sometimes, even though it'll have a digital display, it may not read the right numbers because of a static discharge. I've never heard of that. But I'd be intrigued if anybody in the chat has ever heard of that. Um, but you definitely want to be careful because, you know, on the older scales, for sure, static discharge did affect them a lot. And on some of the older scales, they were in the installation instructions, they would actually tell you to run a ground wire or a ground strap to the cylinder to make sure that it grounds it out so you wouldn't have that static discharge. So um, let's see what else we got going on here. Um, ba -ba -da -da -ba -ba -ba. What's oh, OK, right on looking through. Hold on just a second. Um, oh, okay, cool. <sighs> Let me go through the chat and see what I'm missing here. Uh, can I? Can you install a Schrader valve on an older window AC? Yeah, you definitely can, but um, window ACs are critically charged systems, so they, they contain very little refrigerant, and that can be a problem when you try to put a service gauge on there, so you want to be cautious about that. Um, all right. Uh, let me get to the list of things that I talk about. Um, ooh, I had a great question on a recent video when I was, uh, when the customer didn't show up, I had several people in the comments say, why don't I do the work at nighttime or why don't I let the customer give me a key to the building so that way I can do the work and I don't rely on the customer being on time. Okay. There's a lot to unpack with that question. Uh, yes, I, I have done night work in the past. I despise doing night work. And let me tell you for two main reasons. Okay. Number one. Uh, it screws up your entire week. Okay. Let's say that I do a night job on Monday. Okay. And I, I work all day Monday and then I work all Monday night. Well, then I take Tuesday off because you need sleep. Right. But then unless you work Friday night or Saturday morning, you lose out on a day of pay. 
Okay. So I don't like doing night work for that reason. Number two, I have a rule at my company that my employees are not allowed to be alone in the building unless they have someone else with them for safety reasons. So if my employees were required to do night work, I would require two employees to be there. And then I would lose out on both of those employees the next day. I have a very small company. Okay. If I lost two employees, I'd be the only person working or I'd have one other guy, but I'm very, very small. We're only four trucks rolling, two service technicians right now, a maintenance tech and an apprentice. So yeah, we have a problem there. Okay. I, I prefer not to do night work. The next reason why I don't like night work is from my experience, once you let a customer know that you're open to doing night work, they'll constantly ask you to do that night work over and over and over again for every single reason. Um, I don't like that. I don't like them thinking that it's okay to just have me come in to fix a reach in in the middle of the night. No, that's not what I want to do in a perfect world. Uh, my customers don't really go for this, but in a perfect world, I want to charge overtime doing night work and they're not really into that. They want you to charge straight time and it's just a mess. So I just prefer not to do night work at all. And I do early morning visits. Most of my restaurants have an inventory day where they come in early. So um, most cases, there's one day a week that one of my customers is there at 5 a.m., actually 4 a.m., and then there's another restaurant that's there at 6 a.m. So if I have to do any early morning work, I usually schedule it for those inventory days because they're already there. So um, and that particular customer, and I did discuss it in the video too, that didn't show up, they were, they were told that they knew. I even spoke to the person that showed up. They just didn't show up. So it was all on them. Uh, let's see what else we got going on in this chat right now. Um, Chris says, uh, he does a lot of retro repairs on reach ins. When you size an expansion valve, do I size it on OEM equipment or use Sporland sizing chart or Sporland sizing charts? Well, I always reach out to the manufacturers, Chris, um, majority of the time, if you're working on a reach in cooler, I'm going to give you a blanket statement and tell you that you need a quarter ton expansion valve. That's almost always what you need on a reach in cooler, uh, quarter ton, just put in a quarter ton balance port and you're usually pretty good. Um, but I always reach out to the manufacturers. Okay. I'm not going to necessarily lean just on Sporlin for sizing a valve because the manufacturers usually do weird things with their BTU output of the evaporator coils, they size things weird and stuff. So I always look at what they design the equipment to work with and then go with their sizing. Now, I don't always necessarily use an OEM expansion valve, okay? Depending, if it's R290 OEM, no questions asked. But if it's a reach and cooler, I may find out what the OEM valve is or, or maybe order one OEM valve one time and then find out the sizing. And then from that point forward, just use an aftermarket valve. That's the right size. Majority of the equipment that I work on, it's a quarter ton valve. So uh, let's see what else. Uh, Kevin Sullivan, thank you so very much for that super chat. Uh, and you said at nighttime, wholesalers are closed. Yeah, yeah, I got you. Nighttime wholesalers are closed, um, you know, but a lot of customers and like if you do grocery store work and stuff, they want you in there at nighttime because they don't want the customers, you know, dealing with you doing weird crap in the rest or in the, the supermarket and stuff. But um, it's just one of those things. But I prefer to stay away from night work as much as possible. Here's the next thing. As a business owner, if I send my technicians to do night work, it's very rare if I don't go to the job that I'm not awake wondering how the job's going. I can't sleep, you know, during the day I'm there to answer phone calls and help them through problems, but it's just a pain altogether doing night work. And I just prefer not to do it. Um, let's see. Uh, T Letch says he's had the old CPS and TIFF scales go wonkers by the interference caused by bad fluorescent lights by giving off uh, radio free. Yeah. RFM. Yeah. Um, I I've had lots of stuff. Uh, the old CPS scale is actually what failed by static discharge to me too. I used to use the CPS scales all the time. I will tell you that, you know, now I use the field piece. What is it? The SRS three wireless uh, digital scale. And I have run into issues with that too, where if I'm on a roof and they have like weird satellite dishes, I've, I've had interference with that too, where it starts to read wonky. So with that being said, I still weigh everything before I start. I give myself a baseline that way, as I'm adding something and if the scale stops working, then at least I have a baseline as to where I started. I can get the scale working or I have an old wired one in my van that I'll go grab and then finish it. But I always double check everything before I start, write the weight of the cylinder before I even start putting it in the refrigerant system. Um, Let's see. Uh, in a recent video, I took a, uh, a temporary temporary thermostat and dropped it in the duct. And I tried to address it in the video, but I still got a lot of comments. Why in the heck do I use such an expensive thermostat when it's being used as temporary or dropping down in the ducts? Because I don't carry a lot of truck stock. I carry one thermostat on my trucks. That's it. 
if I need another thermostat, it's got to be, or, uh, you know, I have to order it. So in a bind, uh, in that particular situation, I had an energy management system that wasn't working properly and the customer needed it operational. They weren't approving the energy management system replacement yet. I've quoted it. There's a lot of other people involved because they don't buy direct through me and they just haven't approved it. So bottom line, the equipment needs to be working. It's just a bunch of corporate politics. So I do what I have to do and I put the thermostat that I have in my truck in there. So yeah, it's an expensive thermostat to drop in the duct, but that's all I keep on my truck. And you know, I'm not gonna carry a bunch of other extra stock. Uh, and that's all that I let my guys keep on their trucks too, because we control the stock so that way we don't have a bunch of excess spending. Um, some people emailed me about using like uh, uh, like the, the temperature duct sensors and different things like that in a temporary pinch or the little resistors. And now nah, I'm not into any of that stuff. It's all about simplicity. If it's going to be a thermostat, I'm just going to drop one down in there just in case I'm not the person going back. Um, and then using like the little induct temperature sensors and because there's weird ones you can drop in there that run the whole unit accustats weird things like that nah not into that stuff i just make it simple man i don't want to confuse my guys you know when they come into behind me to try to finish something it's just just it's a normal thermostat or put the automation system back in play so um let's see what else we got going on here um my pinot 8 it says uh you've been doing hvac for 12 years thinking of putting in the R, what's the best way to do that? School? Um, yeah. Uh, go, you know, get enrolled in a school, but this book right here, this is actually the older version. There's a, um, there's a fourth edition, but commercial refrigeration for air conditioning technicians by Dick Wurz. This is a book that's written for air conditioning technicians that want to get into the commercial refrigeration side. This is a great book. It assumes that you understand the basics of heat transfer and stuff, and then it just really goes into depth about refrigeration. So like I said, there is a fourth edition. I just have it in my room because I was actually reading it last night, but this is a great book to get for any technician out there. It will greatly improve your skills. And bear with me, it's getting hot in here. open my slider which you guys don't know what you guys can't see is there is a sliding glass door right here going to like a rose garden in my yard and uh i have a nice little window to open when i get hot in my office because this giant computer that i have running this entire stream is stupid big and stupid hot so need to upgrade my home hvac system for sure so um let's see we answered that question i'm going through my list right now Let's see, Ravi asks about, he sent me a, a picture of his walk-in freezer and he's trying to figure out why he has ice all over the inside of his freezer. He said that he had a bad door heater for the door and he replaced that, but the ice is still on the inside of the freezer and he wants to know why, okay? Okay, when you have ice in your freezer, walk-in freezer we're talking about, okay? Typically two reasons are causing that. Number one, air infiltration. If the door heater's not working on the door or if the door gas gets bad or you have holes or cracks in the walls and there's infiltration coming in, that will cause ice. The second most common reason for ice on the ceilings is a defrost problem, okay? Usually the defrost is running too long and or the defrost termination fan delay switch is not working properly. So on a walk-in freezer, what they typically do is when it goes into a defrost. We naturally have to do a defrost so many times a day to remove any ice or condensation buildup inside the box, right? Or ice. So you, you put it into typically electric strip heat, okay, is what they do. Now, sometimes they do hot gas defrost, but typically it's electric strip heat. Electric strip heaters will turn on, the evaporative fan motors turn off, and it's just gonna, the heaters are at the bottom of the coil, the heat's gonna rise, the cold air is gonna fall, and it's going to defrost the ice. But if the heaters run too long and the box gets too warm and defrost, what will start to happen is you'll have condensation all up on the ceiling and the walls will start to liquefy or ice drops will start to liquefy and they'll start to drop down. Okay. Uh, also, um, when the system turns back on, the evaporator fan motor should not turn on right away. Okay. Because if the evaporator fan motors turn on right away, what it's going to do is it's going to blow steam and water droplets all across the box because also on your coil, there's water dripping down too. So you typically have like a drain period. Um, if you have new electronic controls, but on a older system, you just had a defrost termination switch or defrost termination fan delay switch. So basically 
Uh, if the coil gets too hot when it's in defrost, it kicks it out of defrost. But then at the same time, when the system goes back into refrigeration mode, the evaporator fan motor should not start up right away. Okay, so if you have ice droplets all over your box, number one, look for air leaking into the box, solve those problems, whether it be a gasket or cracks or holes or whatever, solve those. And then the next thing is, is investigate your defrost system. You could have defrosting too long for the coil and or your defrost termination fan delay switch could be faulty, causing water droplets and ice crystals to farm all over the place. Okay, that's the most common reasons why we have ice inside of a freezer. Um, also make sure that your drain is draining outside of the box. It's not leaking inside the box, that kind of stuff. That's really important too. Um, let's see what else we got going here. Uh, Jason Johnson says, come up North. You won't be opening the slider. Haha. <laughs> yeah. It's 10 degrees right now. Yeah, no, it's, uh, it's probably what's the temperature outside right now. It's probably about 48 degrees outside, maybe 50. Um, but it's probably about 82 in my office right now. So it's pretty darn hot. All right, let's see what else. Um, let's see. Um, all right, how do you defrost a window unit that freezes up? Well, there's something causing it to de to uh, freeze up. Typically, it's an airflow issue. It might have dirty coils. Um, but uh, the best way to defrost it is just turn off the compressor, if you can, and just turn the fan on and let the fan circulate. That's the best way. All right. All um, right. In a recent video, uh, the, the air conditioner video, um, I was told to work on the wrong unit was the title of the video. When I went to go make a leak repair on the system, I cut out the, uh, the Cormax high flow Schraders and just put in normal Schrader valves. Why did I do that? Well, the high flow Schraders are a huge leak point or the Cormax fittings are a huge leak point on systems and they can be problematic. Also, they create a big problem when you need to evacuate your system. You cannot remove those Schraders to do an evacuation when you're using the high flow Schraders, okay? Versus a normal Schrader that we use every day where you can put a Schrader core, uh, core, Schrader core removal tool and you can pull the Schrader out. You can't do that with the high flow Schrader. Now, there is a tool to remove the high flow Schrader and change it, but you can't pull an evacuation on the system when it's out. So when possible, I either change the high flow Schraders, just change them out. Whenever I have all the refrigerant out, I just change them out pre pre preventatively and or uh, I replace them with normal Schraders. In a perfect world, normal Schraders are better because then we can put Schrader core removal tools on there and pull a better evacuation. So uh, Tails303, thank you very much for that super chat. Android Man, thank you very much for that super chat, man. I really, really appreciate it. So Android Man says it's time to use his HVACR hoodie. Yeah, if you guys don't know, I do have merchandise available. It's a great way to help support the channel. You can go to my website, hvacrvideos.com. Um, you can see some of the shirts back here. My wife and I handle the packing and shipping of everything. We do it all in-house. Uh, we have hats available. This is my HVACR hat. Now, I purposely on this hat did not put HVACR videos because I wanted you guys to be able to wear these at work and not represent a brand and contradict your uniforms. HVACR is just an acronym, right, for what we do. Um, you know, and it doesn't have my logo or anything like that on it. This is a very breathable um, hat that I purposely had made. It, it's kind of hard to explain until you guys have one in your hands. It's breathable like a trucker hat, but it doesn't look like a trucker hat. It's, it's solid, right? And one of the biggest things about this hat is the black underbill. I specifically had that looked for this hat for a long time because when we're at work, you know, we touch the bottom of our hat and if it's white, it gets all dirty and nasty. Okay. But we have sweaters, beanies, all that stuff available. So if you're interested, check out my website, hvacrvideos.com. Um, Tails 303, again, thank you very much for that super chat. You said, what made me want to get into this trade? You have really good ethics. We need more people like me. Um, I said it kind of at the beginning, but I started working for my father. And I watched my father uh, you know, try to teach me um, the things that he couldn't teach me. I learned on my own, and I grew from everything. I learned my values and my honesty from my father. Okay, I still work with my father. Him and I run the business together. Uh, he's semi-retired. He just does an administrative position. He does not work in the field anymore. But um, he's the person that got me involved in the trade, and I absolutely love it. Now, I do not have any sons. I have two daughters. Uh, both of my daughters have no interest in getting into the trade, which is fine. So, um, you know. 
know, the best that I can do is try to share my knowledge with other people because I will not be passing it on to, you know, my child. Um, so I try to pass it on to everybody else as much as possible by training apprentices, by sharing my knowledge on videos. That way we can continue this, you know, and I encourage everybody out there to share their knowledge too. So, um, Really, I appreciate the people out there talking about the hats. Thank you very much. I really, really appreciate it. Um, let me see what else we got going on in here. Uh, what am I missing? I'm looking through there. Um, yes, I have were heard of Legionnaire's disease. Um, all right, cool. Uh, a cana Oh, I already answered that question. Um, we already did that one. And uh, with commercial accounts, I had a question. Do I get paid on site? No. I work for large chains. And uh, sometimes uh, in a best case scenario, we get paid in 30 days. Uh, that's, not very rare, uh, that's not very often. Normally, it's anywhere from 60 to 90 days before we get paid. It's just part of the game you have to do when you're working with these corporate restaurants. It's kind of a pain in the butt. But it's all about procedures and people doing things right. And if... I don't get the paperwork to the right people in time. And if that person doesn't get it to the right people in time within their company, then the process starts over and it's just a pain in the butt. But typically anywhere from 30 to 90 days is when we get paid and it's a pain, but it is, it's just part of the game. So, um, recently made a video, a couple videos back about a beer walk in not working and it had a blown fuse on the roof. This was the one that had a condensing unit up on the mezzanine with the giant cooling fans that I turned on to a, a annoy the people making videos in the parking lot. Um, but, uh, in that video, I had a really good question in the comments and someone said, Hey, wait a minute. If that was a three phase system, which it was, it was a three phase 30 amp disconnect on the roof. And one of the fuses was blown. And he had a genuine question. If one of those fuses was blown, how did it not single phase the compressor? Because it was a three phase compressor. And if you guys don't already know, if you have a three phase compressor and you remove one of the wires and you still have two legs of power going to that compressor, it will do something called single phasing. It needs all three legs for that compressor to work right. Okay. Uh, Robert McKenzie, um, thank you very much for that super chat. It says from Rob and Jenna met me at the eight. HR show in Orlando, you need some black shirts. So right on, man. I really appreciate it. Um, I have plenty of black shirts available at HVACRvideos.com. So um, speaking of that, and I'll get back to the question real quick. I will be at the AHR show in Las Vegas here in a couple weeks, actually. Here at the end of January, we have the AHR trade show in Las Vegas. I will be doing booth time at the Sporlin booth and at the Refrigeration Technologies booth. So follow my social media. I'll announce it more once we get closer to the show. But I will be doing the AHR trade show in Vegas. I'll be there for all three days if work goes well. And I hope to see everybody out there that actually goes to the show. So back to the question. Why did we not single phase that compressor when we blew a fuse? The customer got lucky because when it blew a fuse it blew the fuse that ran the control circuit. So it actually disconnected the time clock from the picture. So therefore the system did not run anymore. Now on a three phase walk-in freezer system, just a standard traditional one, the disconnect at the condensing unit typically controls the evaporator. If you pay attention to how you wire it, you can wire it in a way that if any one of those fuses ever blows, the compressor does not continue to run, but you gotta get creative with the way that you power certain components in the system. So you have three fuses, two of the legs are gonna run the time clock, you know, and then two of the legs are gonna run the compressor contactor. So between those three legs, if you wire it correctly, if any one of those fuses was to ever blow, you can set it up to where nothing will single phase, but you got to think, and it's often not done via the, the manufacturer. So sometimes you may have to change some things around, but it is possible that you set it up appropriately. So that way, if anything ever blows, as far as the fuses go, it doesn't single phase the compressor and then ruin it. Um, had a, a really simple question, but it's okay to ask these simple questions. You know, I get questions from homeowners, technicians, you know, uh, business owners, and it's fine. I appreciate all the questions. So the question was, can R290 be used as fuel for a barbecue? Yes, it can. R290 is refrigerant grade propane. R290 can be used for a barbecue, but it's a little bit expensive. So you want to be very cautious about that. Right now for a 16 ounce can of R290, it's about $40 my cost. Okay. So with that being said, that's actually right about the same price as 410A, if not a little bit more. Um, it's quite expensive. The difference between barbecue propane and refrigerant grade propane is the purity and the moisture. 
Ref, uh, refrigerant grade propane is like 99.9% .9 pure. Uh, there's no moisture in it and it, you know, it's, it, there's no odorants added to it or anything like that. You can't smell it at all. Barbecue propane has a lot of moisture in it. I know that from experience from having a travel trailer and it not working when my propane tanks got low because they were full of moisture. Um, it, it's just not something. And they add an odorant, which is a, a contaminant. So you cannot use barbecue grade propane to run a refrigeration system. Or if you do, you're potentially going to run into some problems because there's, it's not pure and there's contaminants in it. So, um, uh, oh, I had an interesting question too, and I'm going to say this very carefully because I don't want anybody to hurt themselves. Um, in a recent video, I showcased a tool for fixing the threads. Uh, it's called the Falcon thread fixer.com. I think is what it was. Uh, gentleman, Leslie Orm. Uh, who also runs a website, marketservicetech.com, I believe it is. But he sent me the tool asking me if I would show it in a video. And, and because he's a private person, I have no problem showing his tool. You know, he doesn't have to pay me or anything because it's just cool. I'm helping out a dude. It's not a big company, you know. So anyways, um, but there was comments about that. And someone had commented that they actually have a brand new cylinder of R22 sitting at their shop that is is damaged and they can't access the refrigerant now he didn't give me the details as to why he couldn't access the refrigerant but i have had that happen before and if you guys have not had this happen before i've had the plastic handle completely break off of a refrigerant cylinder right so i couldn't open it to get the refrigerant out and there's actually a really interesting way that i fixed it you have to be very careful make sure you follow all safety practices okay but that handle is plastic and what i was able to do is take a large screwdriver and i heated up the tip of the large screwdriver i put a schrader core removal tool on the cylinder closed it stuck that red hot screwdriver down into what was left of the plastic handle just enough to where it wasn't going to break and then open the valve. So something to think about if you guys ever have a weird situation like that where you break off the handle of a refrigerant cylinder, I was able to fix it by taking a screwdriver, getting it red hot to where it melted down into the plastic handle, and then I was able to turn it, but you had to have a Schrader core removal tool on there. So that way you could ball valve it off. Um, with that being said, then I just put that cylinder in my van and you had to keep the Schrader core removal tool on it because you couldn't shut it off. So cool little hack if you guys have never ran into that problem before. Uh, why are refrigeration condensers sized in horsepower versus BTUs like comfort cooling? Uh, that's a good question. You know, sometimes in comfort cooling, they do it too. It just changes. Um, so manufacturers, I don't understand. They still rate them in BTUs too, but oftentimes if you go to the supply house, you say, I want a three horsepower condensing unit, and they'll tell you that the three horsepower at different temperatures will put out so many BTUs. So I don't understand why the manufacturers do it some ways and some the other. Maybe someone in the comments can tell us. So um, let's see what it got in here. Um, uh, Happy New Year to everybody for sure, guys. Uh, what's my favorite boiler? Um, Laska, I've never touched a boiler. I've seen them. I've seen Raypack boilers before on a roof, but I've never touched one. Don't even know. So uh, the only one I've ever seen is a Raypack boiler. That I got no, no other experience with boilers. What RPM do vacuum pumps spin at? Uh, probably 1725 RPMs because I believe they typically have 48 frame motors on most of them. But um, I don't know, man. It really depends. Uh, you know, I, that's probably not a blanket statement. So um, let's see what else we got going on in here. Uh, all right. So we're going through that one right on. So New Year's. It was a great New Year's. I'm done with, with technical stuff to talk about. I do have something that I'm going to talk about probably on the overtime show. I had a very interesting service call, but I'm not going to get too far into it because I haven't completely figured it out. But it was a really intriguing one. I'll give you guys the cliff notes on it. So over the weekend, I had a service call on a walk-in cooler that was not working. They said it was at 70 degrees. So I went out there what I ended up finding was a bunch of issues, but the system has an EEV, electronic expansion valve, and the electronic expansion valve is having issues opening and closing, or it's opening really, it's having issues opening. So it's really slow to open up. Now I'm not saying there's necessarily something wrong with the valve because there's some refrigeration issues going on too. This is a new AWEF compliant unit. So it floats the head pressure down to 150 PSI. This is a R448A system. And you know, we do not have a very big pressure differential, right? 160 PSI versus what's coming out the expansion valve. So you don't have a big pressure differential to push the refrigerant through, but we're basically having issues with the EEV opening 
fast enough. Um, and what's actually happening is before the EEV can open, because it has a process and a speed at which it opens in, in, in steps, nice and slow, the system shuts off on low pressure. But if you adjust the low pressure control down, right, and get it to stay running, then all of a sudden the EEV will catch up and then it opens and the system runs beautifully. So I got to reach out to the manufacturer and talk to them. I'm not going to give any more details yet, but I need to reach out to the manufacturer because I don't know quite yet if it's a problem with the uh, the head pressure control valve being too low of a cut in or if it's a problem with the EEV, but it's pretty complex. It's a pretty interesting one. So this is kind of a head scratcher. I started to get video footage on it, but I don't know if it's going to be usable video footage because I was definitely getting frustrated trying to figure this one out, but it's really interesting. And I've never really run into a, a, a problem like this. So um, I'm hearing that Ray pack is crap. See, that's why I know nothing about boilers. I've only seen Ray pack boilers. That's it. I don't do any boiler work. So uh, Albert Rodriguez says Appian or JB vacuum pumps. I've used them both. They're both amazing. I personally use the field piece VP X seven is my vacuum pump that I use. Um, and then before that was the VP 85. I'm a field piece fan for sure. But in the past, uh, some of my employees still carry, uh, the JB vacuum pump. I have a couple in my shop and I've had the Appian vacuum pumps too, but I'm a field piece fan now. So, uh, let's see what else we got going on. Uh, do branded tool bags. Um, honestly, I'm going to tell you right now that'll never happen because my demand for quality is just not feasible and economical. So there's no way I could put my name on a tool bag. That would be crap. So just not going to happen. They just don't exist. What's the oldest refrigeration system I've worked on? Um, refrigeration system, probably not that old. I think I pulled out an air conditioner probably about 12 years ago, 15 years ago. I pulled out a 1964 carrier split system. It was a really interesting one. It had an 06D compressor in the evaporator. It was a split system. So the evaporator actually had the compressor in it. And then the com condenser was just piped up onto a roof. Uh, this place is no longer even there. So I can talk about it. It was an old Joe's crab shack, but it was really interesting pulling that system because it was up in an attic of all things. And we had to get it out of the attic downstairs. We had to cut it into pieces. It was giant. Uh, that was probably the oldest air conditioning system I ever worked on. Um, and it's kind of sad cutting it out because what we put in there was like a York split system and it probably didn't even last very long. So, uh, do I sell my used tools? Um, no, I usually give them to friends and, and my employees and stuff. Um, let's see what else we got going on in here. Make patches for people to put on whatever they want. Uh, that's possibility patches and stickers. I've, I've thought about that. Just not something I've really jumped into. So, um, I really appreciate, uh, you Kaden that says always try to watch the overtime show. That's really cool. Um, uh, Kevin Sullivan says EEVs are very sensitive to contamination and welding combustion scale. Yes, for sure. Um, but I can tell you right now that I was the person that did the install on this system purged with nitrogen. Uh, I believe it's a one piece line set. If I remember right, there's only four braze joints on it down at the coil or actually maybe six because there's a P trap in it too. Uh, but I don't think there's any braze joints in the attic. We usually do one piece all the way, uh, reamed everything myself. So I know I did the install. So I highly doubt the EEV is contaminated. It does have a strainer on it, but it's a weld in strainer, which is just idiotic in my opinion, because I have to unsweat the EEV to see if the strainer's plugged up, which is just dumb. I prefer a mechanical fitting that comes off, but whatever, what can you do? Um, try to always use nitro and brazing. Yeah, definitely on EEV systems. I highly encourage if you're ever brazing on an EEV system, that is my policy. Nitrogen is flowing for sure. Um, let's see what else. Uh, right on. Uh, what videos would I recommend for first year apprentice? Um, well, uh, I have a lot of videos, but I'd highly suggest that you go check out my buddy, Brian over at HVACRschool.com. He runs the HVAC school YouTube channel. Um, and that is an amazing YouTube channel. And he has a lot of great beginner stuff where he really explains the fundamentals. So it's a great channel to check out. And then mine's more service related, more moderately advanced. It's not necessarily beginner, but I kind of go a little beginner on some of the stuff that I talk about. Um, let's see what we got going on here. What does it mean when your reefer line set is turning green? It means that it's corroding due to some sort of corrosion. Uh, salt is attacking it or acids are attacking it that are airborne in the system. So, uh, you need to, uh, 
probably going to end up having to replace the lines um, and then coat them with some sort of a, a coating, you know, so that way they don't deteriorate as fast. If you think about it, the Statue of Liberty is made out of copper, but it's green, okay, because the salt is attacking it. Um, same stuff happens in our systems. You know, copper is the, the major metal that we use in our systems. They're kind of changing to aluminum, but copper is still the number one thing that we use. And uh, we put it in reaching coolers and stuff that have citric acids in them, vinegars in them. Uh, there's salt in the air and it attacks it. And that's why it's turning green is because of the corrosion that's happening. I'm sure there's some scientific technical term for the corrosion that happens. But do I play any games? No, I don't do any online gaming at all. So um, right on. Anything happen when I raise the head pressure? What up, Brett? Yeah, so I was actually talking to Brett about that. Uh, yeah, I, I still think that there's something going on inside the valve, Brett, but yeah, I did when I raised the head pressure and I'll go more into detail once we finish this up and figure out exactly what's going on. But once I raised the head pressure, Brett, my TD got a little bit better. It came up to about 16 degrees and my, my, obviously my suction pressure came up too, and it seemed to respond a little bit better, but I didn't, um, I didn't stick around for too much longer because I'd already kind of checked out and knew it was going to operate. And I have not been back since because I know it's operating fine. I've checked in with the customer. I'm definitely going to be going back. But um, I still am really thinking there's something wrong with the, the, the EEV and or the programming of the EEV. But I don't doubt that the head pressure being low was part of the problem. Uh, Brett and I, Brett's from the Advanced Refrigeration Podcast, and, and I had called him kind of picking his brain about the issue. And he brought up some really good points because what they're doing on this system is floating the head pressure down. Um, I think at the time, I think I was running about 160 PSI head pressure for 448A. So the, the liquid line temperature was rather low, right? And uh, Brett was pointing out that sometimes that can be a problem pushing the refrigerant through the valve at the proper flow rate. And, and I do agree that that was an issue, like, you know, floating the head pressure down that low, especially if you have a pre-built evaporator um, where the expansion valve wasn't sized appropriately for that. Um, again, I need to talk to the manufacturer to figure out some more. Uh, one of the other things to factor into this, too, because this is a, a major cluster F of a situation, is this particular location in the summertime literally gets 120 degrees. So the condensing unit is sized for 120 degree ambient to put out the BTUs needed to cool that box down when it's, when it's 120 degrees. Well, right now the low there is 37 degrees. We have a big temperature swing right there. So that compressor is massively oversized right now. And that's what Brett was kind of, you know, talking to me about too. And uh, so it made a little bit of a difference, but I still think we got some other issues going on. There's some sort of a restriction somewhere, but it's weird because it's just on the opening of the expansion valve and it's an EEV electronic valve. So it opens slowly, but once in, and it starts out, the superheat's really high for the evaporator around 50 something degrees, which is bad. But then after 45 seconds to a minute, the suction pressure comes up, the superheat drops down, and then it regulates just fine. But it's just that initial opening of the valve that's really, really struggling. So we'll talk some more about it, Brett. And then once I figure everything out, I'll make a video on it, guys, and it'll probably make a little more sense. So, all right. Um, have I ever used a tester for train voyagers with the resistance? Uh, a decade box is what you're talking about, Carl D. Um, no, I've never used a decade box, essentially putting a resistor across the terminals to simulate certain conditions on a train unit. That's how you can control certain operations is by shorting it with a resistor. Um, no, I've never really done that. I've thought about making a decade box where it has a bunch of different resistors and a dial that you can turn so that way you can test the functions and different things. Just never gotten around to doing it. I know there's decade boxes you can buy too. Just never done it. Am I ever going to get John Israel on the overtime show? No, I don't think that's going to happen. Um, does a damaged AC fan motor damage the compressor? I definitely can, Joe Burke. If it doesn't have any kind of protections protecting the compressor, it certainly can hurt it. Uh, Chris Cooley says the transducer. Chris, I, I'm assuming you're talking to me. I did verify that the transducer was accurate and all the temperature sensors on the equipment were accurate too. So the problem lies either with um, the, the system's pressure being too low, uh, the EEV not opening fast enough or the programming of the circuit board causing an issue. I don't think it's going to be a circuit board issue and I don't, I don't know, you know, it's, it's an interesting one for sure. So, um, oh, Carl saying he made a custom controller. Yeah. I've always thought about making it Carl, but I've never done it. So, 
Um, all right. Well, guys, uh, this is about it. I'm, I'm about out of steam and I need to go eat some dinner. So I really appreciate you guys coming into the stream. Thank you very much for all the support, all the super chats that came in. That was very amazing. It's very humbling. The support that I get from you guys, you guys are awesome. Brett, if you're still watching, I'll talk to you soon. We'll talk some more about that call. And, uh, once I get to the bottom of it, I don't think I'm going to go out there for another day or two. So I'm sure I'll talk to you a little bit more. Um, but yeah, that's it. I really appreciate you all. Remember, uh, I go live on the HVAC Overtime YouTube channel with my buddies, Bill, Adam, and Joe on Friday evenings, typically about 6.05 p.m. Pacific. If I missed any of your guys' questions, feel free to send me an email to hvacrvideos at gmail.com. And uh, remember, be kind to each other, guys. We've got a lot of craziness going on out there. We can use a little more kindness. So I really do appreciate you, and uh, we will catch you on the next one.